Ave. I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you once again to our ongoing series of Classrooms on the Air. Now, if you've never been here before, if you're new to this, and we want to thank all the thousands and thousands of people every week who are coming to whether it's Rumble uh, and the Gary Knoll Film Library or Gary Knoll YouTube channel uh, or Odyssey, wherever you're watching this, then you know that I deal with all the topics that you would need to know if you want to grow, stay healthy, live a longer life. These are non-controversial, uh, and all my information is based upon good quality science. You can verify that by simply going to uh, the National Library of Medicine, and you'll find the information there as well. Today, we're going to talk about intermittent fasting. Let's go back in time to the mid-1970s, almost 50 years ago. I was a young scientist at the Institute of Applied Biology. This is where all these very brainy people, great scientists from around the world were working downstairs. Uh, I was on upstairs laboratory and they were working on the cure for cancer or the end of pain. They had all kinds of medications they were working on and good for them. You know, we, we, we needed something to help stop disease. But I didn't do anything with medicines. My work was on lifestyle and behavior modification. So what could we do to stay healthy, prevent disease? And if we were sick, what we could do to interfere in that disease process and try to revert back to good health. And it was a full-blown laboratory. And uh, I would only have a, someone come in, like a Dr. Berman, who would then verify my results, my outcomes. I'd say, Vic, uh, I've just done this. Could you follow the same protocol and see if you come up with the same results? Because the foundation of good science is replication. Meaning if you create something, then take your protocol, give it to someone else and have them follow the protocol and do they come up with the same results? If they do, that's good. If they don't, then you have to question whether or not you actually had the positive results you think or believe you had. And in one study I read recently, up to 67% of all studies that are published cannot be reproduced. Wow, that's not good. And we better tighten up the peer review process and have absolute proof that before something gets published, it can be reproduced. In any case, I was thinking about something and I was invited up. Uh, I was thinking about veganism. I was a vegetarian. I still had dairy. Um, no animal proteins beyond that. And I was invited to attend a workshop upstate in the Catskills. And I'd never been to the Catskills. So I said, okay. I was curious. And I went up. And it was for one week. And it was from the Vegan Society. And they were not just vegans. They were vegan natural hygienists. I, I didn't even know what it meant to be a natural hygienist. And so uh, I watched these people. And I was young. I'm in my early 20s. And their average age was probably 70. So there was almost a 50-year gap between us. Now, I've always respected senior citizens. I've had friends who were, you know, old enough to be my great-grandfathers, like, uh, like Dr. Emanuel Ribisi and Paul Swan and Linus Pauling, Abram Hoffer. And uh, they were long into their careers when I first met them. But we shared a lot in, of interest in life and science. In any case, so these were all nice people. And a couple of things I noticed that really surprised me compared to the senior citizens I knew growing up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and the first senior citizens I met in New York City, they were vibrantly active. I mean, they had the energy. And I noticed how clear their eyes were. And there was one woman, and her name was uh, Billy Jean, uh, Billy Mc, Billy Jean McFadden. Now, why is that name important? Because she first came to me wanting to know, would I like some books? I didn't know who she was. She showed up at the radio studio where I did a broadcast on WMC radio. And she said, these are my husband's book, first edition. Who's your husband? Bernard McFadden. I said, the Bernard McFadden, the most important person in the health world in America for decades. She said, yes, that's, that's him. We were married for a long time. And, uh, Interesting, he died in his 80s, 
by celebrating his birthday by skydiving uh, by himself medication and he died from the consequence of that medication whoa in any case she said uh, that she was there also and her skin was just as wrinkle free no botox they didn't even have botox back then her skin was wrinkle free and uh, and she was vibrant she had real blue eyes and she didn't have um, muscle fl flab flab under her muscle she had muscle and no flab and she was lean and all these people were lean so at dinner and the food was not and I was not prepared for this everything tastes like little mud balls remember is if you were a kid like you make <laughs> mud balls mud patties anyhow that's how everything tastes there was like no seasoning like we don't use seasoning like, Ooh, something's wrong with the seasoning will I you know and grow a mustache on my forehead i'm i'm thinking what are these people about i've never tasted food that's just as there's no taste to it they didn't use salt they didn't use pepper uh and if they use some herbs i couldn't taste them anyhow um so here i was eating this amount of food not a lot and salads were okay and they did have olive oil good but they took their time eating that was the first thing i saw wow you know, uh, I ate too fast. I was kind of embarrassed. You know, I'm finished. <laughs> They're just another hour to go in their meal. They looked at me and smiled like, he's an idiot. Gary's an idiot. He's from West Virginia. Um, and it's okay, Gary. You know, you're doing everything wrong. Because I was asking too many questions. They were very quiet. And then I had asked the most important question. I don't know any older healthy people. All the older people I know have multiple illnesses. Could you please tell me which illnesses you all suffer from? And they all started laughing. Gary really is an idiot. <laughs> no, they didn't say that. But I'm thinking that's what they're thinking of me because I'm so naive. And uh, which is not bad. It's not, you know, if, when you're naive, you ask questions because you want to learn something. And people who are older and wiser uh, will look at you and think, well, okay, let's help him. Thank goodness they did. They had no illnesses, none. About 40 people, not a single illness. One guy was 91, and they would go out for these long walks in the morning in the mountains. And the, the, they, they would drink juices. They had lots of juices. And uh, they would make, mainly it was carrot and celery and some root vegetables. They'd just juice it all. And all day long, they were juicing. And then every third day they fasted they just had juices no solid food and i was not that aware of fasting so i asked him what's this going without the food well we're we're going without the food to rest our digestive system and i said with well, the digestive system's working 24 7 they said yes but we're not bulking it up and then the man said you know how much putrefying material is in your gut if you're the average American, probably anywhere from 7 to 15 pounds. So by modifying our, our diet and not having animal proteins and not having a refined carbohydrates and the sugars, not having the potato chips and the french fries, then our food goes in. It's clean food. It's healthy food. It's organic. It digests. And we get maximum assimilation. We get maximum absorption of our nutrients. And therefore, none of us have nutrient deficiencies okay and when we fast it really allows everything to come out of the system so you got a clean digestive system we don't have ileitis crohn's disease spastic colon diverticulitis we have none of the itises he said and then i thought okay well that's new so anyhow i finished this wonderful week with these wonderful human beings oh i felt so coming back uh, and and billy uh, uh, billy drove me back but she stopped me off i didn't know this existed i hadn't been to livingston manor which is about two hours north of new york city from the george ocean bridge and it's beautiful country you get these long views you can see for 10 15 miles of rolling countries and pastures and idyllic farms and uh it's the hudson valley where uh, Thomas Cole, the great Hudson Valley artist, and uh, Frederick Church did many of their paintings. And um, she said, 
I'm going to take a detour here, and we're going to go up a little further. And uh, I want to show you a place. So we went up, and here was this place, uh, sitting a normal-looking house, uh, sitting, um, but there were many other buildings. And it was sitting on a, at the top of this mountain, and you can see everywhere you saw. And it hadn't been in use in a long time, probably about 15 years. And they had these all across the countries. These were detoxification, rejuvenation spas where people went. She said, in the 1920s, my husband, who was the second largest publisher in the United States behind William Randolph Hearst, and he wrote all these books on vitalism and health and exercise. And he was a friend of Dr. Kellogg of Battle Creek Mission, the Kellogg brothers, Kellogg's cereal. But one of those two was the first real natural hygienist you know, cleansing the body, fasting, clean food, um, the recolonizing the bacteria with fermented foods like apple cider and apple cider vinegar and sauerkraut, et cetera. And, uh, and you would come here and she took me around for an hour showing me this is where we had our sauna and this is where we would go from a cold day and snow uh, where we would be in hot water in here with minerals in it would run out in the snow and then back in like they do in Sweden and Japan. And uh, and that was not going on anywhere in America, by the way. Everything she was telling me they were doing in the 1920s through the 1950s were done nowhere else in America. Now it's common. Now infrared sauna, of course. Who doesn't have an infrared sauna, people say. And uh, juicing, of course we juice in colonics, yeah. For a long time they didn't, but these people did. They were way ahead of everyone. And uh, she said, I, I sit here now and I look out and I remember being here with my husband and all the guests. I am doing lectures outside here in the summertime. And it was just, it was heaven. And we would have a whole patch of melons growing, every kind of melon you could think of. And we'd go over there and we'd have people get the melons, come over, and we had a hose here, wash out the melon and just break it open and take your hand and just eat it out. She said, <laughs> I think that's really cool. And uh, so I got a real education. She was 90, 90 years old. She looked 50. She had the skin of a 20-year-old. No wrinkles on her hands, her neck, her face. And she took in a lot of bite of carotene. Now, we didn't know the chemistry of all these fruits and plants that we know now. Each fruit and vegetable has upwards of 100 to 200 different phytonutrients. And they were taking a lot of antioxidants. They were taking a lot of the ORAC, the antioxidant that traps free radicals, that stops the cell from being damaged, that allows you to prevent disease and live a longer life. So when I got back to the city, I decided I'm going to do something. So I asked the institute director, and I said, is it all right if I do an experiment on modified fasting of rats? Yes. So he, he set aside a thousand rats, and I then fed them not a normal diet. I fasted them two days a week where they got water. And then I decided, why give water? I gave juice. I made fresh juice every day. So they were getting plenty of nutrients, chlorophyll, from the water on their fasting days. Well, lo and behold, another group that is a control group of 1,000 rats, they live their normal life. And they passed in that 12-month period, at around 12 months. My rats, that I modified their diet and fasted them intermittently, they lived 22% longer, and they were much healthier. Their coats were healthy. They didn't bite their tails. They didn't engage in cannibalism, which is very common. And uh, so I thought, whoa, did that week mean a lot to me? as someone who was young and naive and uh, didn't know a whole lot? Yeah, it did. And I, I, I really appreciate I came from a family that taught me humility, that, uh, that stay humble in your actions and your heart so that there is no one you won't be able to relate with as an equal. So if you're dealing with the poorest of the poor or the wealthiest of the wealthy, you're both still at the end of life, going to go in the same ground. Maybe with a better monument showing you were alive to your legacy, 
people are going to remember you because of your heart energy. Were you kind? Were you thoughtful? Were you joyful? Did they enjoy being around you? Not by your possessions, not by how big your house is or how big your ego is. And generally, the bigger the house, the bigger the car, the bigger the ego. This is what my mother taught me growing up. And so anyhow, so I was able to learn because I listened. And because I listened, if something made sense, I then tried to duplicate it. And by trying to duplicate it, I then was opening doors that science said you couldn't open. But I was opening them. I was seeing things. But because at the Institute, as I would later find out, there was a lot of jealousy about I was using lifestyle and behavior no awards for that, no no Nobel Prize for that, but I was able to show the prevention and reversal of disease that many of the much smarter people downstairs and all those other departments doing all that research provided by the big pharma, they weren't getting the results I was getting. And so none of my articles ever was submitted for peer review publication, and I didn't know that. That's just something brand new that one of the, my, my supervisor, wonderful human being, you talk about a workaholic. I never saw her not at the Institute, whether I worked day shift or night shift overnight. She was always there, seven days a week, never took a break. And I said, don't you have a social life? Don't, don't you have a relationship? She says, oh, my science, helping discover cures. That's, that's my relationship. Okay. Now, uh, she, uh, she would come in and I would hand her my papers, proving all my work, all my charts, all my lab works. And I was thinking it was going through a process to get publication. And now she tells me, yeah, she tells me. And why does she tell me? She called me. Interesting. She said, uh, Gary, you didn't know it, but I had end-stage pancreatic cancer. I didn't know it. I haven't been in touch with her in years. And she said, uh, and I thought my life was over, but I used the research that the head of the Institute, who was a, the greatest cancer researcher she'd ever known, and I'd ever known, he had results no one else in the world of cancer ever had. I used that along with anything else that my oncologist would provide, and I beat that. And then I ended up having five strokes. And I can't type, I can't, my hands are paralyzed. I'm overcoming that in another couple of months, so I'll be able to go back to work, she says, right? And she wants to go back to work after spending uh, almost six years in the laboratory every day. In any case, I, I wished her well. I said, what's the call? She said, I got to get something off my chest. And I said, what is it? She said, the director of the Institute really liked you. He was engaged in anti-aging research in, in Romania, where he was from, and then at the Institute Pasteur, and he was working with a Dr. Anna Oslin, have you ever heard that name? If you listen to my radio show in the 1970s on WMCA, she was on on a regular basis. She was the leading anti-aging doctor in the world. People from all over the world went to Romania to go to her clinic to get her different therapies. And she was highly respected. Well, the head of the institute, who had gone from Romania, at the, then past her institute in Paris, then had to flee Paris in the 1940s when the Germans took over France, and he was Jewish, and they would have killed him, incarcerated him, concentration camp. Uh, he came to the United States and founded the Institute of Applied Biology. So his heart was always in living a long life. He lived to be 102, by the way, and then said he was too tired to keep living. He had done everything he needed to do, and so he passed. Because I remember sitting on at his bedside at the hospital, and I said, I can help you with this condition. He said, Gary he said, you helped me when I was uh, 87. That saved my life. Trafalgar Hospital. He said, uh, but now I've done everything I could possibly want to do. I'm 102. It's been a good life. So I'm ready to pass. And that was it. I had to respect his wishes. But she, go back to Elena. Elena said that when my research, over 165 studies, positive results, including the one on modified fasting, can extend the lifespan by 22%. That was only one. I would send in all my work. The people, the senior scientists said, well, what if 
you know, big pharma finds out and they don't want to fund us anymore because someone's doing research that says you can get well without all that. There's a, and she says there's a lot of politics then. There's a lot of politics in science now. I didn't know any of that. I was grateful that she apologized and gave me that insight. It doesn't change the fact of how many people would be alive today based upon all that research I did back then. But I'm able to have forms today. Today, I don't get censored. I share information. I'm working with world-class world uh, anti-aging uh, foundations, universities, and doing clinical studies. So it's not too late. All right? And now I'm sharing this directly with you. Now, I share all that because the proof scientifically that intermittent fasting came from that study because I talked about it on my radio show. And uh, I would talk about it in articles I wrote. These weren't peer-reviewed journals, just my normal lay articles. And virtually all the people I work with, I had them cut back on calories because caloric restriction is one of the most important ways you can prevent disease, slow down disease if you have it, and even reverse disease. So we're eating too many calories, we're eating too much protein, we're eating too much animal protein. Even vegans can take too much plant-based protein. There's no mechanism for storing protein. You cannot store protein. You can store calories from fat and carbohydrates. You cannot store amino acids. There's no mechanism. So it goes through a process called deaminization, which means breaking down the amino acids. The trouble is it's very challenging to the liver and kidneys because then you secrete byproducts of breaking down that extra protein. One is ammonium. And, and that is toxic to the liver and, uh, and the purines, excess purines, to liver and kidneys. Uh, urea is another byproduct. In any case, we get on these high-protein diets, we're eating way too much protein, way too much. In one meal, we might eat a whole week's worth of actual protein that we need. So we're consuming too many calories, too many empty calories, too many garbage calories that cause inflammation and cause us to become overweight. So there's where intermittent fasting helps break that cycle. I'm working with someone right now who is morbidly obese and near death. They have been able to go from seven killing diseases. I'm talking about uncontrolled blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes, um, uh, with three medications and blood pressure is still diastolic and all this systolic is still over 200. This is from their medical doctor, and all this doctor just kept doing was giving more medication, more medication, because that's all they need. Never talk about getting rid of the sodium in the diet, and this person was a big salt eater, liked everything salty, and got rid of all the salt, increased potassium, magnesium, uh, calcium in foods, juices. And the person's been on an intermittent fast, juicing every day, having lots of clean, healthy, filtered water and juices with all the full spectrum of vegetables and fruits and uh, salads and soups. The person uh, is from Trinidad and makes wonderful uh, root vegetable soups. I've tried some of them. They're delicious using all the natural herbs, but no salt, using lemon juice instead of salt. Because lemon juice on a baked potato uh, tastes like salt. You put your olive oil on there and your seasonings like cayenne, which has capsaicin, which helps to it facilitate greater flow of blood. It helps heal the arteries, turns off pain in your joints, and uh, it's a great healer, uh, the red peppers, cayenne pepper. And so anyhow, now you take a potato and it tastes like it has salt on it. It doesn't. Get rid of the salt and start using lemon and lime juice, and that can help. And on salads, apple cider vinegar is great in probiotics. So now what we want to do is we want to lessen the protein we, of animal sources. We want to get rid of the sugars. We want to have clean, healthy foods, lots of fresh juices and water. But we also want to take at the last meal of the day, let's say that you are a late eater. That's not good. That means when you try to go to sleep, you still have food in your stomach. And when you have food in your stomach, if you saw the stomach, it looks like an inverted pear. There's two, there's two openings to the stomach. One, the cardiac sphincter muscle opens, allow food to come in. Two, the pyloric sphincter allows the food in the form of uh, chyme. It looks like a thick potato soup. 
to go out so the nutrients can be absorbed and taken into your system and assimilated and used, utilized, and then debris eliminated. Digestion, absorption, assimilation, utilization, and elimination. Those are the stages. Now, if you take your time eating, remember that from the, all the vegans took an hour and all of Europe takes an hour to eat at least, sometimes longer. And you can always tell the Americans, they're finished in three minutes. <laughs> they're done looking around like, is there any more to eat? No, we're, take your time. Time, time, slow living, slow eating, slow cooking, slow talking. Take your time. It de-stresses you. Great time to de-stress, enjoy your friendships, and uh, absorb the aroma of the food. Look at it. You're becoming what you're eating. So if you are what you eat, why would you want to be a Twinkie? So just remember, garbage in becomes garbage. Healthy, clean, fresh, organic food in. Healthy, clean, vibrant, vibrant and cell protective uh, nutrients. It's common sense. It's good science. So we want to have um, we want to have a cleaner intestine. We want to have more regular bowel movements. Uh, we want to have more fiber in the diet. So it, you, that's your meal. But then let's say that you finish your meal at six o'clock, which is a better time to finish. There are exceptions. That's fine. Now don't have your next meal to at least seven o'clock the next morning. Allow 12 hours in between the last meal and the first meal. That's intermittent fasting. Now, ideally, it's 15 hours. So when I have my last meal, let's say at 6 o'clock, I want to have my a breakfast meal until 9 o'clock. So I'm giving myself 15 hours. And in that 15 hours, there's rejuvenation. There's cleansing, cell cleansing. There's debris uh, going out of the cell and being taken out of the body. There's a flushing with liquids uh, out of the kidney, cleaning the kidney and the liver. And then one day a week, preferably the day off, maybe a, a Saturday or Sunday, you don't eat any solid food at all. You juice that day, liquids and juices. And you can, you know, throw in a protein smoothie, but no solid food at all. And that is intermittent fasting. And what does the science today show? All of the science. 100% of intermittent fasting and caloric restriction are the two things that can be proven to prevent disease and extend your lifespan. All right? But you have to get accustomed to it. You'll start getting hunger pains, in which case just have some cold water with lemons in it, lemon juice, that turns off your appetite. If you must have some kind of solid food because you're used to having pizza late at night and going to sleep with a half-eaten pizza, and you wake up with that piece of stone in your stomach, which is not good, and your whole metabolism's off, and your melatonin in the brain that helps you sleep and rejuvenate your body is off. You're not getting a good night's sleep. You're waking up. You're not getting that deep, rapid eye movement sleep. That's often because you've eaten too late at night. So instead, have some organic, no-salted popcorn. Now, that popcorn doesn't have any calories in it, but it will then it will turn off your need for satiety. You'll feel fine. You'll feel, I'm satiated. I don't need anything more. So, but if you don't need those, good. And watch how much longer you sleep, how deeper you sleep, how much more energy you have in the morning, how much better you feel You're rejuvenating. I wrote a book once. It's out of print now. It's called Why Your Stomach Hurts. And I go through a whole book just showing you digestion and how to eat foods in the right combinations and how to enhance digestion with some enzymes, proteolytic enzymes, like having a piece of papaya, having a, the core, the thick, pithy core of the pineapple. And these nutrients that are in the core of the pineapple and in the flesh of the papaya, both bromelain and, uh, and other uh, micronutrients, help facilitate better digestion. Even in India, if you've ever eaten an Indian restaurant, an authentic Indian restaurant, they frequently have on your table a little teaspoon. You can take a fennel seeds. Those fennel seeds help facilitate digestion. 
And of course, don't forget the probiotics. Get the probiotics in there. They facilitate better digestion, a healthy, healthy colony of trans good bacteria in the, in the intestine, which then creates a healthier overall immune system. So just look at all the connections. Healthier diet means more fiber. Healthier diet means less calories to our actual body needs. Healthier diet means get rid of the animal proteins, put in plant proteins, but don't put in more than what you need because the body can't store it. So you should have protein three times a day. All right? Don't just have one meal a day. It's not good, not healthy. Uh, stay away from all these fad diets because they're not good for you. And then one day you realize, wow, I'm looking down, I, I see my abs instead of a belly. When I look in the mirror, I see muscles. I have my balance, fluidity of motion, ease, endurance, strength, stamina, clean skin, no Botox. No, my face, look at my face. I'm under spotlights, high definition camera, and I can actually move my eyebrows. Other people using Botox can't. And why? Because I take enough vitamin C and quercetin that create good collagen that tightens the collagen. And when you tighten the collagen, you don't have the wrinkles or the jowiness. Fingernails, pink, hard, and smooth, not cracked and flecked and ridged and fungus. Same with the toenails. Good circulation, good nutrient absorption. Take your time. Slow down. Don't bring your anxiety to the dinner table or to your meal because you won't get good digestion. And relax. Just before you eat, just take some deep breaths and just relax. And just say to yourself, I'm calming myself. I'm calm. When you do that, your body chemistry changes. The rhythms to your heart electrical stimulation is normal. When you're anxious, you can disrupt the normal heart rhythm and electrical charge and therefore cause a regular heartbeat. And that can cause a stroke. So when you get angry, you get rageful, you get insecure, you're killing yourself. Let's take our time. And that's one of the things I saw all those people up there long time ago, over a half century ago. They were calm. They were joyful. They laughed. They were healthy. They had no diseases. And yet they were senior citizens because they were following some basic, simplistic concepts of life. Remember this. Never confuse the complexity of a problem with the simplicity of its solution. Don't try to make the solution as complex and convoluted as the problem. That's it. That's our classroom on the air for today. And I hope that you engage it. And uh, this will be in greater detail in an upcoming, uh, upcoming new book that I have coming out in about four or five months from now. But you can go every day at noon Eastern Standard Time to prn.live, P-R-N, Progressive Radio Network, prn.live, and listen to my show. Or you can go to the archives and download any of the shows. I've always got original programming, hard-hitting program, uplifting programming, and program that looks for the solutions, but never blinks looking at the problem. Go to garyandall.com, you'll see all the articles and what I've done throughout my life, not me saying it, all third person, uh, proof of all the things I've done to show there's legitimacy in this. Because be aware, Wikipedia and other people will try to put people like myself down because if people listen to me and follow my advice, they wouldn't be spending all their money on a lot of the dangerous foods, beverages, and drugs that are currently out there that people are making hundreds of billions of dollars profits from. I understand it. I never talk about it. I just go on with my life. But oh, just to show you how you should walk away from Wikipedia, I've written 72 articles, not one. And I send every single article to Wikipedia's top lawyers. If you can find something I said that's wrong, I'll change it. They've never responded with anything being wrong. They don't like me writing these articles, but they're all honest. So see why I don't use Wikipedia, and I believe you shouldn't either. And that's up there too. 5G, that's up there too. So I have all this information there for you. Just take advantage of it. Again, because I just realized this that, that will throw us off. What I just said will throw us off of, of YouTube. 
So that's it for today. I hopeful, I'm hopeful that you will find this information useful and try it. All right. You can also go to prn.live, P-R-N, Progressive Radio Network, prn.live, noon, Monday to Friday, and Tuesday, 7 to 8, to listen in on my show. If you can't do that, go to the archives and download the programs. Go to garyandall.com. You'll see all my articles and videos, a whole lot of information there to help enlighten you. Have a nice day. Are you tired of closed-minded programming? Well, look no further than prn.live, the home for progressive voices.